now move on to a series of panel discussions. It's through these discussions that we come to know about the work being done on the ground, what could be further innovations that could be adopted to improve health outcomes across our country. Now, pursuing our vision for healthier nation year on year, the India Health and Wellness Summit has had several sessions debating the pillars of health, which include determining, delivering, innovating, accessing, and communicating health. We have designed this year's summit based on these very pillars of health to trigger another stimulating discourse in the pursuit of our vision of health for everyone, everywhere. It is essential to identify what health and its determinants are. Under the pillar of determining health, our first panel discussion is set to commence on the theme of good food, good air, and good water. Testing the pillars of preventive health. The pillars of preventive health are marred with challenges the world over. Food security and nutrition, water and sanitation, and environmental and pollution challenges are making healthy living impossible. How can we get collective action that's focused in or invested in a future with better health? To discuss this, I would like to call on stage our esteemed panelists to discuss this topic. I would like to call upon Mr. Alok Tripathi, Executive Director, PCRA, to please come on stage to participate in this discussion. Mr. Alok Tripathi is the Executive Director of Petroleum Conservation Research Association, PCRA. As ED, PCRA, his responsibilities include budgeting, planning, and execution of programs and activities relating to fuel conservation and environment and promoting energy efficiencies in various sectors of the economy. I would next like to call upon Mr. Gulbahar Torani, Marketing Director and Business Head at Philips. Mr. Torani has been the Director of Marketing and Business Head at Philips for over five years now. He previously worked in various roles in sales and marketing during his career in Philips India, which spans over a decade. Next, I would like to call upon Mr. Apurva Bhandari, founder of Sankalp Tadu. Mr. Bhandari uh, holds an MBA in oil and gas management and started his career working with Bharat Petroleum Corporation, BBC Health. He has also worked with a few IT companies and was on consulting assignment in the US before he decided to return to India and, found, and he founded Sankalp Taru. A round of applause for our panelists, please. And I would request uh, Dr. Bobby John to come on stage. He's the session's chairperson. He will take us through this session. Over to you, Bobby. Good afternoon, everyone, once again. And uh, it's my privilege once again to start off a series of short conversations with people who have, as part of their day jobs, the responsibility of doing things that affect or improve people's lives, and in particular, their health. Um, Mr. Tripathi, Mr. Tarani, Apurva, thank you so much for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. As we've been told, we work on a few pillars and we're trying to understand how things work together to determine health outcomes. And so therefore, there's this whole idea of spaces where health is determined. It's not readily apparent, but it's much further away, but actions there actually turn out to be quite formative as to how health um, gets shaped down there. And then of course, we know the a traditional way of delivering healthcare, innovations within them, how to enable access, and understanding how we communicate about it. But this is the furthest away in the chain. And so therefore, the biggest pictures that we need to kind of draw out. And so let me start with you, Mr. Tripathi. It is pretty much clear, going by yesterday's reports that was uh, co-authored by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and also by the PHFI, 
that one in eight deaths are attributable to an environmental cause. So, very cynically, shall I ask you, can we stop breathing to prevent deaths? Okay, so I'll reply to this question. First, let me tell you one thing. Those who are sitting in this side of the room, they are having cleaner air. You can see the indication on Philips air purifier. And those who are on the right side, they are very unfortunate people that way. So uh, yes, so this is uh, really a very critical issue as of now. In fact, this is the most important issue, the air pollution. Uh, let me ask you one thing, or uh, uh, I'll give answer myself also. So when we discuss these issues in uh, city condition, when we discuss these issues in capital, then primarily we have something in mind which is related to outdoor air pollution. But that is not the full fact of air pollution. So air pollution has got two dimensions. We know it that household air pollution is also equally important issue in this country. In fact, it is probably much more important because this is affecting the poor section of the society. Uh, we know that as per the census, only 29% of the population was actually using the clean fuel. So effectively, 71% uh, of the population was affected because of the household air pollution problem. Uh, just to give some data, one of the data you have seen in the Times of India, which has come up today, but then, if you see the data, it has got two important issues. One is the death part. So we know that more than 1.2 million deaths are accounted to air pollution, and out of that, roughly 50% death is attributed to household air pollution. This is all happening in poor section of the society. The second important issue is the loss of the economic productivity of the population of this country. So we know that there is a concept of disability adjusted life year dailies. And if you see the data, you'll find that in 2016, as per the global burden of disease data, which was released by WHO, 2.2 crore dailies were lost only on account of household air pollution. The total loss, daily loss, would have been almost double if you account for outdoor air pollution as well. Now, this daily doesn't make any sense unless if you convert it into the financial value. So there is a concept which is called WHO choice model, which basically assesses the monetary impact of the daily lost. And this is calculated simply by multiplying dailies with the per capita income, which is released by World Bank. Assuming that the per capita income is $1,600, you can well imagine the kind of economic loss we are having because of the household air pollution. It is more than $60 billion annual. So this is a very important issue. There is an urgency also, not only from the part of the government also. Government is taking some steps, but I'm not claiming that this is all happening in perfect sense. But this is collective responsibility of all of us to think and do something to mitigate this issue. Thank you, Mr. Tripathi. I mean, and part of my job is also sometimes to paraphrase what um, our esteemed panelists are saying so that our audience also has got a, a shorter bite to uh, chew on. So essentially what you're saying is when we are scared about air pollution, we are literally looking at what's out there in the um, sky and we're saying it's darker, but what we're ignoring is the fact that our houses are equally or if not more polluted and so therefore that has got an even greater impact, particularly for those populations that are staying much more indoors. So that, that's pretty much the import of what you're saying. So to somebody whose line of business is essentially air purification and putting out these machines, as you said, the fortunate ones are sitting on the left-hand side of the stage as far as we are seeing, do you have a solution in the outdoors? as much as the ones that you're putting out indoors. And we'll come back to the indoor conversation because I really want to hear from you, then come back to a question that is burning now because of Mr. Atripati's um, answer. So if you can take that mic there. Do you have something equivalent for those boxes for the outside world? See, so, uh, you know, and thank you, Mr. Tripathi, for bringing the facts out, okay? And I will just, before I reply, I would like to say something. 
See, one of the major challenges that you have indoor before I go to outdoor is they have to actually point out, looking at the machine, that there is pollution inside. Okay, right. Because it's not visible. That's the situation we have indoor. Now, do we have a solution for outdoor? As of now, no. Because what we are concentrating on is there is a lot of talk about outdoor pollution. There is now a lot of awareness among the consumers, among the people of India, that there is an outdoor pollution. It's visible also. And there are being actions taken by various agencies, whether that's government, whether that's social sector, whether that companies and all. Uh, we are at this moment focusing on the challenges of the indoor pollution. So from a solution point of view, we have solutions only for indoor pollution. So here's my problem. Each time I open my door and I have got these things assuming in my house or inside this hall, each time I open the door, all the good that these machines did is undone because suddenly there's air that's coming in from the outside. That's why I asked you the question. While I can spend money, and it's literally a factor of spending money that, that allows me to have clean air inside my house, each time I open my door, in the same way that I ask the question, shall I stop breathing? My next question is, shall I stop going out of the house or stop opening my windows and doors? Because that seems to be the biggest hazard as far as indoor air pollution is concerned, opening the door. So, how do we solve that? Apurva, I mean, do you have something on the outside? Yes, of course, uh, coming from uh, the social sector, especially is Sankal, representing Sankal Tharu, uh, which is very much instrumental in planting trees. So, um, our focus has been uh, uh, creating green lungs uh, for the cities, as well as planting various green, creating various green patches across the country from Ladakh to Tamil Nadu, across 16 states we are operational. Um, definitely, uh, if we talk about high level of PM 2.5 or 10, uh, these particulate. So um, the easiest method for beating outdoor pollution would be definitely planting trees, more and more trees. Uh, not so far from this place, um, you know, near Manesar, we, are, uh, we have taken up entire Aravlis of 20 acres and we are greenifying it. So uh, concept like urban forests or um, sensitizing residents about planting trees which have better canopies because it's not only about absorbing uh, carbon dioxide, it's also trapping particulates on, uh, you know, we need a media for that and trees in fact act as a source of trapping those particulates. So we need to sensitize residents who can plant those kind of trees, which help in purifying uh, definitely outdoor air, as well as, uh, you know, we need green lungs for those cities in adjacent areas. So, uh, Mr. Tripathi, the solution seems to be indoors buy these machines and outdoors keep planting trees. So that way you kind of trap up all the PM 2.5 and the PM 10s, and so therefore um, we have a solution. That seems to be more a, a kind of solve the problem kind of thing than prevent the problem uh, approach. Uh, how do you kind of see a prevent the problem approach going forward? At the mic, please. So again, I'm saying one thing. When we talk about household air pollution, it is not only the city where I'm talking about. So yes, if you open the door, probably the outside air will come inside and it will make the indoor air also bad. But the indoor air pollution has got larger, um, the more important reason of indoor air pollution is the use of the solid biofuels. It is not happening in our houses, it is happening in the poor section of the society, which is actually creating the household air pollution. We know that, uh, uh, so uh, the 2011 it was 70%, uh, it has come down to roughly 50% as of now, but yet 50% of the population is still affected of the use of solid biofuel. So first of all, we have to find out the causes of indoor air pollution in different sections of the society. Technology is fine, I am saying it is good because it is, it is able to clean some amount of air inside your house. But the bigger issue is how do we replace the burning of solid biofuel by the clean fuel options. And where comes the role of government also, there comes the role of creating awareness also among the people regarding the adverse health impact of the use of solid biofuel. We are doing something and there is much more to be done in this regard. 
Talking about the outdoor, outdoor air pollution, again I am saying planting tree is good, it is one of the option, but then there are several other measures which are to be taken. And we'll so, come to that, we'll come, we'll come to that in a moment, because let's hold on to the indoor bit and let's, let's skin that a little bit more. How many of you are aware that the reason why Indian cooking does not, I mean the traditional Indian cooking has not gone to the Tandoor, it, it's not entirely um, uh, the rest of India, it's only to the northwestern part of it, is because our traditional fuel source was cow dung, which did not give us a high enough heat point beyond boiling point of water. So much of our cooking is based around the boiling part of it, and that's why we are a land of curries and less the land of the kebabs, because it requires a higher heat point. We, we got that a little bit later. And so therefore, take your point, yes, we have to pay attention to the switch over from the traditional um, household fuel, which is, being, which is entirely biomass based, to what has been happening over the last five years, this whole Pehel direct benefit transfer scheme. How much has that enabled us to move from the traditional biofuels to the newer modern ways of um, cooking, which has allowed for a decrease in household or indoor air pollution? So, uh, I'll just correct one thing. Pahal was actually the subsidy transfer scheme. It is basically the PMUI scheme which is expanding the reach of LPG among the deprived section of the society. Prime Minister Ujjula sure. scheme. Uh, so, when we have to expand the clean fuel access among the poor, there are a couple of barriers. One barrier is affordability part. And again, the affordability part has got two dimensions. One is the upfront investment, and the second is the recurring expenditure. So Pahal is able to take care of the upfront expenditure because uh, we are providing LPG connection free of cost to the poor families, identified poor families. Uh, as far as the recurring expenditure is concerned, I think most of the people will be knowing that uh, government provides subsidy on LPG cylinder up to a certain quantity to every household to keep uh, the price constant and to keep it isolated from the fluctuation in international prices. To that extent, we are also able to take care of the recurring expenditure. So has it helped? Yes. So in 2011, the people who were using LPG was roughly 29%, roughly. Now the if you see the coverage of LPG connection among the population, it has gone up to 85 percent. Coverage. Coverage. Usage. So, so I, I'm coming to that point. I know what you wanted to say. So we have been able to provide access of clean fuel to roughly 85 percent of the population. It doesn't mean that everyone is using LPG uh, entirely for meeting its uh, cooking need. There are people, especially the poor ones, who are using LPG as well as the other kind of dirty fuels. So there is a good amount of fuel stacking which is still present. But I can definitely say that the percentage which was 29%, it has gone up to 50%. Roughly 50% of the households are now able to meet their complete cooking need using the LPG. Thank you. I mean, that's, that represents a significant shift in terms of how the household uh, indoor air pollution patterns change, uh, particularly in the poorer segments of society. So therefore, hopefully we should be seeing lesser numbers of respiratory illnesses turning up into the hospitals, especially among women and children. So that's, that's one of the um, standards or outcome indicators that I would hold, correct? Yeah, so, uh, so this is my personal observation. It has got nothing to do with the government view, which I am going to state very clearly here. See, affordability is the most important issue in uh, uses of clean fuel. Government has been able to take care of the afford affordability issue to some extent. But still we find that the very poor people, especially the people who are below poverty line, for them probably we need to do something more beyond the subsidized price of LPG. We need to probably lower down the price prices also so that they have willingness to purchase LPG, which is very important. As of now, the subsidized price itself appears to be slightly higher on the higher side. The uh, 
the important issue is that many of the people are not aware of this indirect benefit of use of LPG. See, uh, if you keep using solid dirty fuel, it is not going to immediately affect you um, adversely. So, for example, if I start using wood today, I'm not going to have respiratory disease tomorrow itself. It, it develops with a passage of time. That is why people are not able to appreciate the use of clean fuel. To that extent, we need to do much more education campaign to create awareness also. And of course, the availability is another issue. So I think availability is the first prerequisite. Then the second comes the affordability and then comes the awareness also. Yeah. So then, if we have skinned that issue, which is let's shift to the major pollutant inside homes, and then what remains is essentially opening the door and then um, the pollutants are coming in. Is there a way that the boxes out there, which are now Philips badged in this room at least for this afternoon, can they become more accessible and affordable? Or is there something that needs to be done completely differently? See, I would say uh, that journey has already started. Okay. Uh, if you look at the prices today from what it used to be three, four years back, it has come down drastically and it's, it's, it's going to remain the same because that's with any technology when you see the technology coming into the market and that's the price cycle that you see. But more importantly, one of the factors that we need to focus upon today is the awareness bit of it. See, uh, we need to get this awareness right that there is pollution inside this room. And, and we have a very esteemed audience and still we need to point out to the air purifier saying, you know, look at the readings bit of it. So that's the work that I believe uh, as a responsible brand we have taken up and we are trying to do because uh, once you are aware of the problem, then only you try to get a solution for it. Till the time you are not aware, you don't come to the solution bit of it. So uh, more and more uh, reaching out to the consumers, the people, and telling them about the ill effects of the indoor air pollution and it exists is something that we are trying to do at the current phase. As far as the technology price is concerned, I think that's a cycle that you will see in this industry. This won't be any, any different from any other industry. So, so let me be a little bit problematic to you. Sure. Okay. I can be made aware that there is a great way to get from point A to point B on four wheels. It will give me a no-jerk ride. It will be the smoothest ride that will have. It just happens to be at a price point. I'm aware. Why? Because the company that's manufacturing it tells everybody that this is the best way to get from point A to point B. Spend so much, you will get this kind of a car. And if I'm not able to afford it, it isn't a matter of life and death for me. I will use the metro, I will use the bus, I'll use a cycle, I'll use whatever else. But when it comes to as basic as air, I mean, to my starting point, shall I stop breathing because I have to protect my health? Now there, you're telling me there is a product that actually helps you breathe clean air, which is allowing you to live longer, and then you're saying it costs. And here, you're increasing my awareness, and now I'm also feeling the pinch that I'm unable to afford to breathe clean air, something that should be a very basic right. Now, how do we square this? So, um as I shared earlier, see, of course, uh, as you rightly said, I am aware and then I don't have it, it, you know, pinches me. Uh, I will still say there is a uh, lack of awareness on this subject, so we keep on doing that. As far as affordability is also concerned. A lack of awareness among the people that can afford it. Uh, yeah, Correct. there is. Sure. There, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the current, uh, you know, population which is aware of the indoor air pollution as Mr. Tripathi also tried to say that, you know, there is outdoor air pollution that's visible. There is indoor air pollution which is not visible. So there is an awareness work which needs to be done. Coming back to the affordability point of view, um, we are trying our level best to get very relevant, meaningful, meaningful innovations at the right price. And that's what I'm saying. If you look at the price graph of air purifiers, and I'm not talking about Philips as a brand, but I'm saying generally as, a, generally as a category, it, it is seeing that journey and you will see that this is going to become more and more affordable in the, in the coming times because brands are sincerely working on that point because we also believe that this is something which should reach to each and every household and we know that affordability is going to play a part into it and that's why there are sincere efforts in place 
to ensure that we are able to avo provide affordable solutions in the coming times. Sapur, were you hearing these two gentlemen who are talking about the sources of pollution and, and, and a technological fix to it? You seem to be in the great outdoors and you're trying to grow trees over a long period of time. How does that even begin to scale to the indoor side? Or is there something more to the way that you're thinking? So, uh, surely, in fact, there are plants which can, uh, which can absorb, um, you know, these pollutants indoors as well. But, um, I mean, yes, surely, uh, I heard, um, you know, my, uh, my fellow speakers as well. Uh, now, I believe there is an acute need to have collective action somewhere as well. Um, because definitely there are solutions, but what are the sources of pollu pollutants around us? So maybe we'll have to, you know, arrest then and there, and then have a collective action again, you know, uh, then attacking these uh, sources, and then collective action towards, you know, purifying air, and, and as, as the, uh, panel discussion is ar around food, good food, good water, and good air. So I believe then these collective actions, uh, of course, can lead towards you know uh, uh, harvesting these fruits or or air or or water. So definitely tree plantation again um, is one of the medium, but. Yes, there is a need to uh, have a collective action around it. So before I come to the PCRA um, gentleman, Mr. Tripathi, here's, here's what I saw in um, the newest rankings or newest um, collation of data. 71% of global pollution, environmental pollution, of, is accounted by 100 companies. Of the 100 companies, in the top 10, at number 6 is ONGC, India. At number 43 or 46, somewhere, is um, Singer and Coal Field. And down the line, there's one more Indian company. Three, four, three people in the top 100, accounting for 71% of global air pollution. And so now, to the Petroleum Conservation Research, Research Agency, we are talking about solving it at the consumer end. What about now the big solutions? How do we look at not just the biofuel at the um, household end, but fossil fuel at the biggest ends? And where do we see the big shifts happening? As, as um, Mr. Bandari was saying, we need to look at different solutions now. Where, where are those big ones coming through? So uh, the mandate of PCRA is fuel conservation energy efficiency and environment protection. Uh, so when we talk about energy efficiency, that means we are asking different sectors of economy to improve the fuel consumption uh, from the perspective of improving the environment as well as from the perspective of increasing the energy security of this country. So when you talk about the companies, so I'll focus first on the industry part where uh, we are having some intervention so one of the very important scheme of Government of India has been called PAT scheme, Perform, Achieve and Trade Scheme. So those of you uh, who know about Cap and Trade Scheme, uh, it is more or less the same kind of a scheme. Uh, the PAT scheme has been applied to various industries that includes refinery, that includes steel plants, thermal plants, uh, steel uh, plants, textile industries, and many industries. And uh, the almost 63% uh, of the total energy consumption is accounted to all these industries which have been uh, coming under the PAT regime. Now, this scheme is basically the mandatory energy audit of all the designated consumers. So uh, the government of India has identified high energy consumption industries and they have been designated as designated consumer. They are mandatorily subjected to energy audit. They have been given target uh, to reduce the energy consumption below a threshold. And if they are, they are not able to reduce their energy consumption, then they have got two options. One is they can pay the penalty, which itself is a big thing, or if the one particular uh, industry has 
achieved much more than the threshold, then uh, this industry has got something which is called e-cert, e-certs, e-certificates. So the more polluting industry will have to buy e-certs from the less polluting industry to meet its uh, uh, norm. Offsets. Yes. So uh, the there are four cycles which have been introduced so far. I'm only focusing on this because this is a very beautiful scheme and it covers mostly 63% uh, of the total energy consumption in industrial sector. Uh, in PAT cycle 1, which was introduced in 2012, uh, the results are already out and uh, we have been able to save uh, what we have decided much more than the target. It is almost 8 million ton of oil equivalent energy have been saved. PAT 2 cycle is still going on. PAT 3 cycle has also been introduced and PAT 4 cycle has recently been launched. So I think uh, this will take care of significant uh, uh, requirement of energy saving or energy consumption in industrial sector. So thank you. I mean, for those of us that are more bread and butter doctors or people who are working in the healthcare industry and you're wondering, what is this PAT scheme? What are these offsets? What are these carbon credits and things like that? Remember, this is a session where we are talking about how health gets determined. And, and when I started off, I said, these are actions that take place far away from where our individual patient is. The patient comes to us with a respiratory illness or there are large numbers of asthmatics that are coming or people are saying that we can't breathe or there's uh, more of a discomfort. Well, the solutions are not going to be at your clinical bedside. The solutions will be far, far away. And these conversations that take place in a very different space altogether are not exactly visible to each one of us, but they matter. Because, I mean, and, and I have to correct myself, it was Coal India at number six, ONGC at number 40 something, and it was Singrani number, it's number 80 or something like that that was there in that list. And these three together accounted within the 71% of the entire globe's um, pollution uh, contribution. Yes. F figuring out a way that our polluting industries or our consumers are able to have better e energy efficiency is something that we as healthcare people need to be very aware of and begin to engage with, is my short point. Yeah, but then I think uh, why coal India is one of the most polluting industry in the world, probably because it is producing coal, which is getting utilized in thermal power plants, right? So what I was talking about, improving the operational efficiency of different industrial segments. You are talking about the uses of coal as such. So I think there, if you... Uh, so my thinking is that uh, there should be a policy framework where uh, we should shift from coal and fossil fuel based energy production to a renewable source of energy production such as solar, wind, biogas or waste to energy conversion, etc. It is happening. In fact, in, in case of solar, we are very aggressively pushing the solar uh, based electricity generation and uh, we have revised our target also and hopefully we'll be able to achieve those targets. But yes, uh, thermal power plants are still a very significant amount of... So let me turn to the two of you. Philips, hotbed of innovation for the last century, especially where it impacts health and healthcare segments. I mean, these are on your consumer side. What can we expect from an innovator over the last century now, today, to solve bigger solutions? I see a um, effort from the Virgin founder basically saying, hey, let's put $3 million out there for better air conditioning. At a time when global warming is taking place and there is an increasing demand for cooling in settings like ours, that's only going to drive up the use of energy. That's only going to drive up the, co the, the, the consumption of coal because in the absence of anything else, some electricity has to come. Where is the innovation happening from companies like uh, Philips to both solve a human well-being uh, situation at the home end, but also solving larger issues at the same time. Uh, if you look at the mission statement that we have, is touching improving 3 billion lives by 2025. 3 billion lives. 3 billion lives, yeah. yeah. Uh, why we want to do this and how we want to do this is, we have a complete health consortium wherein we want to focus both in preventive care, and that's why you see an air purifier, you see an air fryer, you see, uh, you know, innovative gadgets which can help you, uh, you know, have preventive care. At the same time, uh, 
you know, you all are aware that we invest heavily in the R&D bit of it to, you know, develop te technology which helps you diagnose correct correctly and then cure accordingly. So that's the whole bit that we are trying to do and preventive healthcare becomes very important for us and a large chunk of our R&D is today going into preventive healthcare. And you will see more and more innovations in that side from Philips to help people have a better life you know, because we all believe that prevention is better than cure. And that's, that's the focus area for Philips today and that's, that's where we are putting ma majority of the effort on. So Apurva, let me, let me kind of uh, pivot to you. So sure, uh, the more number of trees that we grow, we will probably have better air quality. They will uh, function as carbon dioxide sinks. They will be giant uh, filters and traps for particulate matter in the um, urban landscapes. All of that is there. But there's a different function that trees also provide, right? It's holding the topsoil together. It's allowing for runoff water to now be halted and be recharging the water table. That's a different conversation from the air side. And I want to just quickly try and um, scratch that surface too, because while we have people who can speak very well to the air part of it, I want to kind of begin to talk in terms of the water part of it too, and you seem to be the one that's on the cusp of both. So surely um, planting trees and vegetation definitely helps in um, you know, increasing the water table. And um, as I mentioned, our initiative on Aravlis which is very much fragile and acts as a uh, water recharge source for, for Gurgaon and, you know, nearby regions. So, yes, in fact, these initiatives were started by us, keeping that in mind that not only uh, we would be uh, creating green lungs for these cities, but then we have to do something for water recharge. Uh, plant specific species, uh, typically in Uttarakhand, we are doing a project uh, called Project Detol City Shield, where we are planting, uh, we are coming up as an alternate to pine tree, which is very combustible. It catches fire very easily, and we are Forest you know, aware of yes. So we are planting oak or banj, which is very native to the uh, village or the hills, and it rejuvenates streams there. It helps in rejuvenating streams in five to six years. So definitely, those kind of initiatives would be required. Um, you know, to recharge the water table. The reason why I kind of pivot to trees and the water table is a very simple one. For those of you that were hearing me when I said that the hypothetical 75 billion kilogram Indian will require 150 tons of pure protein every day. That's two grams per kg body weight, right? Assuming that we've got 1.5 billion people by the year 2022. In order to consume that much, we have to have about a five-fold amount of dals or other kinds of proteins because that's, the maximum availability is only 20%. So for 150, you have to produce about 3,000. Now, what happens to that kind of water? Do we have that kind of water underground? Sorry, India is severely water challenged right now. For all that we're talking about interlink of rivers and stuff like that, that is not a solution when you come across that kind of water demand. The way that we can even begin to address our thirst, forget our hunger, is going to be to trap fresh water that comes from above and figuring how we recharge our water table. And the only way that can happen, and so it's like where you're sitting at is you're killing two birds with one stone. You're trying to clean air at one end and you're also trying to hold water, which is not very visible to us. The bottles are here in front of us, so therefore we think we have water. But this is very expensive, inaccessible water for those that desperately need it. And so, how do we go forward with that? Is, is the scale at which you're operating enough, or what do we need to do to get to the water side of the story? So, uh, definitely, um, you know, we are working with a lot of corporates now, making a larger movement. Uh, to make it happen. Of course, one thing I forgot to mention, now, while planting trees, you yourself require water. So, how do you tackle that situation? You know, so, especially um, when we are working on urban forests, so, you know, we are, uh, we are, in fact, 
uh, taking, um, I mean, water, STP water, we are utilizing it there. We have micro drip irrigation system uh, so that, you know, we, we, are, we are efficiently using water to uh, grow those trees. So, you know, these kind of collective efforts would also matter, um, you know, not only in tree plantation, but farming as well, because farming itself consumes a lot of water. So we, we in fact, require a lot of uh, efficient irrigation systems. You know, drip, micro drip irrigation would be one of that. So surely we can tackle that situation. So in the, way, same, in the same way that Mr. Tripathi mentioned about household or indoor air pollution, let me now turn to all of us here. Every one of us is living in a reasonably good flat which is not exactly water efficient. We are consuming water way beyond our means. And so in the same way that we need to be mindful of how we are tackling indoor air pollution, we need to be very, very mindful of every single drop of water that's coming off of our faucets or our toilets, because that is hard to get water, which is why you're saying that to grow trees or your plantations, you're beginning to now look at a sewage treatment plant um, outputs so that you can use that to grow your trees and then try and use them as traps. Otherwise, it's not going to go forward at all. The second challenge, let us not think that we can buy our way out of the water crisis in the same way that we cannot buy ourselves out of the air pollution crisis. We will have to begin to think far more. So which is why the second point that I had made an ounce of prevention will require a ton of collaboration. It's not an equal, equal number. Those of us that are at the clinical end or at the service end of looking at human health and suffering will have to figure out how we come out of our comfort zones to be talking to those that are making the policies. What are the standards with which we have our housing um, approvals being done? Is it energy efficient? Is it water conservation based? Is it something that is contributing to the total load of pollutants outside? So the refrigerants that we're using, the fridges that we're buying, the air conditioning that we're using, all of them begin to add up very, very quickly. And those of us that are living in the metropolises right now, we are disproportionately putting out a load onto the environment than those in the rural areas. It's easier to see the problem in the rural areas but the contributors are coming in from the urban areas. Your closing comments on this. So I agree to whatever you have said. Uh, so one uh, takeaway from this for me at least would be that whenever we are having the building plan approved by the competent authority, we should definitely have some provision for seeing whether the building is going to be water efficient or not, whether the building has taken adequate steps to, to have the water conservation, whether the building is also having sufficient amount of plantation available there so that air is also clean. I think that's a very important point and that should be taken care of by the government also. So if, we, if I look back the discussion for last half an hour, uh, one thing comes out very clearly is as a society, we need to develop an ecosystem. If we look at the problems or the solutions in pieces, it's not coming together. How it is coming together is, if we have an ecosystem which helps us live better, that is required. So that's one thing that for sure, uh, and everyone needs to contribute into it. As far as uh, we as a brand is concerned, uh, you asked this question also, I will again repeat the commitment of Philips of investing disproportionately on bringing preventive care and helping pe uh, live people a better life. So surely I do agree uh, with the panel that, um, you know, we all act, we should all act as a society, uh, and the entire ecosystem should come forward to balance it. We see a lot of imbalance there now, right? And um, Coming from the social sector, surely we need to mobilize more and more people uh, because the lifestyle is also leading to, you know, these kind of challenges. M more of carpooling, um, you know, saving in fact, at the RO, uh, I mean, RO water rejects a lot of uh, water there itself. So 45%, small, small to 55%. Yes, so maybe, you know, for mopping and household we can use. So all these small, small interventions would matter and we need to 
sensitize people to make those savings and I, I believe you know those small small drafts will make an ocean so here's where I have now about seven minutes to turn around to the audience you've had a very large conversation you're talking about big climate change big pollutions um, big water sinks or, or, or PM 2.5 PM 10 sinks as urban lungs where are you thinking or what is the question that is burning in your head for this panel or for us collectively to think about and if you stick up your hand um, if I can see beyond the lights I will definitely have a mic come to you to ask the question yes sir right at the back uh, thank, uh, thank you sir your name sir my name is Naresh Sagar I have been a technical person from the beginning, we have uh, many MSME on my uh, portfolios. Now, my question is very simple. With the advent of urbanization, will the technology is going to make pace with the advancement of carbon dioxide also? Because as you get into modernization or as you get into development, the, the carbon footprints are there. You can't avoid them. But will this technology advancement can outpace the uh, carbon footprints and we can move ahead with the, uh, you know, fresh air? Simple let me, question. Let me, let me, let me uh, rephrase that very simple question. The simple questions require a little bit more of thought. So let me kind of add something to it. Solutions come because you throw money at it. Are we prepared to throw enough resources to answer that gentleman's question? That is, are we going to outstrip the carbon problem or are we always going to play catch up? It's a tricky issue because environmental problems are wicked problems actually. Uh, the question is very simple but the answer is very difficult. But I just want to give one example, and I'm very optimistic about those things. So if you see the solar development of solar electricity uh, globally also, you find that uh, two, three years back, the, the rates of solar electricity were very high, and it was not at all competing with the grid electricity. But now, even in our country also, we see that uh, now you have uh, solar-based electricity generation where the rates are quite competitive. In fact, it is much lower than your, the electricity which is you, produced from thermal power plants. So in some cases, we are finding that technology is growing very fast. It is outpacing the emission, uh, this uh, carbon footprint, especially in case of electricity. But in other sectors, we need to find out. And I don't think that I can see any other example where we are actually doing great thing. We would look forward to a conversation with you, sir, um, as we break over um, and have coffee together. Um, folks, it's been, it's been absolutely lovely to have this conversation where we've jumped from um, what's the quality of air inside the house, how do we solve it outside, um, are the solutions interlinked to other problems that we are concurrently facing, and we realize that um, trying to determine health requires far greater thought and, and, and linking up dots long before the event itself happens. As we have, we have the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, um, Professor Randeep Guleria, um, who will come up next to speak to us. He, from his clinical perspective, he's a pulmonologist. He, he looks at chest medicine. He looks at people who can't breathe too well. The solutions that he will offer at the bedside can be reduced by several factors. If some of the things that we folks here that have talked about it can actually get our act together. Now, getting our act together means we need to have all three sectors together. And it's, it's kind of interesting that we have all three sectors here. We have the government sector here. We have the market sector here. We have the social sector here. We need to get all three working in sync. No one sector can solve this on its own. We need to have the foresight, regulation, and investment from one side. We need to have the innovation and the risk that's taken on by another. And we just need to have the grunt power and the staying on the ground and keeping on calling out the issue from the social sector so that together we have a solution that allows for 
the prevention of women and children at home or those that are particularly vulnerable to respiratory illnesses to be affected by um, lung diseases. Or for that matter, when we are really thirsty, we do have a clean glass of water to drink. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. It was a lovely conversation. And folks, can we give them a round of applause, please? And can I ask for the mementos to be brought? To be Thank delivered? you so much, gentlemen. I would request you to please stay on stage for a minute longer. I would request uh, Ms. Nikki Gupta to please come on stage and uh, give away to our panelists a small token of our appreciation for taking the time out and participating in this very important discussion uh, so that we have uh, access to better uh, and uh, quality air and good water, clean water as well.